Okay, let's get started. Uh, my name is Tristan Claridge. I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Uh, the Social Capital Research Group is an international collective of, of researchers. There's over a thousand members, uh, people who are interested in social capital. Uh, we've got academics as, as well as PhD and master's students, um, as well as people working in government and non-government organisations and other people who are interested in, in the concept of social capital and its research. Very pleased to be able to announce our invited presenter for this session, uh, Vangelos Tontos. Uh, he completed his undergraduate studies in philosophy, education and psychology, masters in psycho psychological research methods and PhD at the University of Sussex, examining how community groups emerge and respond to flooding and how group processes and disaster behavior can be useful for community resilience, policy and practice. Since 2018, he has been a lecturer in social psychology at the uh, Canterbury Christchurch University in the UK. His general interests include collective behavior in disasters, social movements, leadership and mass mobilization. He recently developed an interest in how systemic issues can operate as stresses that can exert a negative influence on mental health and well-being. And I'm very pleased to see that he's also an advocate of, of mixed methods research with both qualitative, such as discursive and phenomenological and quantitative uh, survey and experimental approaches to data collection and analysis. So over to you, Evangelos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for everyone for being here. So today I will describe, I will talk about the work that I and another colleague have done, both of us on the topic of flooding, and we will present a range of studies in which we are trying to advance the theory and um, behind social capital through some empirical evidence of flooding using the theory of social identity and self-categorization, and we will see what it means. So the main argument today will be that social capital is a very interesting and very useful concept, but it's quite static, and we need to be able to outline a bit better the different processes that um, underlie human behavior, how people come together, how they give support um, in climate change, in disasters, and how this can expand our understanding of social capital, and how it interacts, let's say, with social identity. So I will start with some very brief information on climate change and why it's an issue worth examining. So we know that because of climate change, for instance, there will be increased frequency and intensity of extreme events, much more, um, more heat waves, more flooding, more hurricanes, more droughts, um, wildfires. And it's one of the main factors that can affect global development and well-being. So it's a very, very important topic, of course. I don't need to uh, talk more about this. We know that it causes health inequalities, malnutrition, infections, and we saw that with COVID anyway. And also in terms of health and mental health, um, climate change can increase the prevalence of mental health problems, distress, grief, anxiety, PTSD, suicide. So there are reviews on all sorts of issues associated with climate change at the human level, at, at the physical level, natural level, etc. Now, in terms of flooding, because this is where mine and my colleagues' case studies have taken place on, on the topic of flooding, a few words about it. It's the most common, actually, weather-related incident globally. Um, during the past decade, 50 out of 53 countries in the WHO region were affected by flooding and at the global level in the last 30 years, 35 years now, 200,000 people died and 2.8 billion affected. So we know that if this gets worse by climate change, um, it has the potential to affect many, many more people than it already has, and it's already a massive number, right? Climate change, of course, increases the prevalence and severity of floods, and interestingly, we have very severe and very long-lasting psychological impacts. So let's see some of these. Increased depression, anxiety, PTSD, ongoing property damage. Of course, the waters might recede after three, four days, maybe a week, but the damage can stay there for years. It can cause homelessness, it can disrupt social relations. So if we think about social, in terms of social capital, flooding can actually destroy the social ties in, uh, in communities. People can lose their possessions, again, the physical um, um, aspects of how flooding affects um, 
they will it can disrupt the sense of place. Again, if we think about social capital and communities, it can disrupt people's sense of belonging to a place, lack of agency. It can destroy social networks, and people might expect much less support from their communities because sometimes they're just not there for months or years. And what are the main stressors through which flooding exerts its influence? Some of them are primary stressors, which are related to the disaster itself, right? So people might die, might watch someone dying, um, their house is flooded, so lots of physical damage, injuries, shocks, um, infections, and so on. These are the primary stressors, but also through secondary stressors, which are different types of stressors. They are not linked to the disaster itself, the flood waters, let's say, but they are linked to life events, um, social circumstances, or structural issues that interact with the disaster and cause more damage. Loss of employment, financial hardship after the flooding, um, difficulties in claiming back compensation. It's a major stressor in the recovery period of flooding. Very hard to rebuild homes. People lose their physical possessions, persisting health conditions, no social networks in the long term, not having control, fear of the event happening again. So many of these we see that they happen because of structural issues in the long term after the waters, of course, have, have receded. So one of the main ways in which governments and other institutions try to deal with climate change is by increasing the resilience of communities, right? And we see the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. It's about preventing new risk, reducing existing risk, and strengthening resilience. There is a lot of discussion about resilience. In the UK, we see there's a strategic national framework on community resilience. It's about the commitment of the government to enhance national security, um, to develop existing structures, to strengthen resilience at the local level. So community resilience is one of the main concerns, at least of the UK government, which is where I have worked. Um, I have worked in the UK for the past few years. So we see that the discourses about community resilience are very interesting and they're everywhere. So it's interesting to try and see what are the underlying concepts that all these institutions are mostly using to talk about community resilience. And if we see this paper by Norris and colleagues from 2008, we see that they identify four main areas of community resilience, and one of them is predominantly used in terms of the social behavioral aspects of community resilience in official guidance. So we see that Norris and colleagues talk about economic development, information and communication, but they also talk about social capital. And we know that social capital is about uh, informal ties or ties within the community or ties between communities and other institutions, which are the main elements, right? And these are the aspects mostly discussed in community resilience guidance. We need to have stronger ties within communities, between communities, between organizations and communities, so that if a disaster happens, communities with stronger bonds will respond better. And this is more or less what we see, that it's a trust, bonds, and norms of reciprocity from these dense social networks, a classic definition here. Um, or according to Bourdieu, for instance, the aggregate of actual potential resources linked to the possession of a durable network of relationships of mutual acquaintance and recognition. We have different types of social capital. I won't go into too much detail. Bonding social capital, bridging, and linking. And Daniel Altrich has used the concept to examine disasters in a very, very interesting way, very interesting work, showing that both his work and the work of colleagues, that social capital is very important for preparedness, response, and recovery. Communities with more social ties are more prepared. Um, there is more fairness, more trust, more community knowledge, more social support, mutual aid, and they mobilize resources faster and they have more resources for recovery. Right. So it's a very interesting, very useful concept. But what are its limitations? If we look at the paper by Norris again, we see that there are some elements that are not linked to what's traditionally seen as social capital. So a psychological sense of community, what I will call later um, community identity, let's say, and also a whole other branch called community competence, which is about community action. It's about creativity and being flexible. It's about effic collective efficacy and empowerment and problem solving. 
And all these different dimensions are not traditionally captured by social capital, at least in most of the work that I have reviewed. Um, most is about the different social ties or participation or connections between and across communities. So I will now discuss a bit more about the psychological element. There is what we call emergent communities in disasters, and I think this is quite a bit of a challenge for social capital research. These are communities that actually emerge in absence of any pre-existing bonds and groups. People come together spontaneously. They form groups, they give support. There is this emergent sense of, uh, emergent sense of togetherness. People that didn't know each other come together. And of course, all this can't be explained by pre-existing bonds. Um, these have been termed as therapeutic, altruistic, or disaster communities. And what we see is that when disaster, disaster hits, social boundaries, um, different boundaries between different social groups tend to dissolve many times, and people actually come together. It doesn't matter. People will say it in all types of disasters, in my interviews included, it didn't matter what color, religion, gender, class you were, we came together and gave support. That's something that people quote very often in interviews. And Fritz, back from the mid 60s, says that these communities occur because of common fate. People suffer in a similar way and they come together and give support to each other. So how can we best explain it? And how can this type of incident help us go a bit beyond social capital in a more dynamic way? to understand this community mobilization, this sense of empowerment, this emergence of community. Why does it happen? So these are the, the main limitations in terms of social capital research be, before I go and explain um, more about emerging communities. In general, there is many times, not always, but many times, a limited definition of community. The focus, at least on official guidance, is on established geographical communities within which we identify social groups and we measure them in social ties and how strong they are. But there are also psychological communities which spontaneously appear during disasters or communities of circumstance or altruistic or therapeutic communities. And the other question is, when these communities come together, do they transform into social capital other than yours? Do they transform into ongoing social bonds that persist after a disaster? So in other words, do emerging communities facilitate the creation of social capital? And if yes, how? Why does it happen? The second issue is that pre-existing groups, pre-existing bonds can't explain emerging communities and this spontaneous creativity that appears between strangers. So we need to look a bit more into collective efficacy and empowerment in a more dynamic psychosocial way, how different social and psychological factors interact and do things. Um, we need a more um, deeper exploration of the mechanisms that underlie the operation of social capital. Like, okay, we might have strong groups, which are very useful, strong bonds, but why? Why does it appear between strangers? How is it eroded? How, how does it persist? Also, these networks are not always active. Something happens. There is some psychological, psychosocial process that takes place for all these groups, all these bonds to actually um, emerge and be activated. So we need to examine a bit more this process of empowerment and involvement in mobilization of communities in a collective manner. Why does it happen? In general, this, there is a wider call um, by Berlin colleagues for a systems approach, systems types of thinking to examine how social, structural, environmental factors interact to actually um, facilitate behavior in extreme events and climate change. So I will now try to explain a bit how we try to make sense of emerging communities and the theory behind it. So the main theory is from social psychology and it's the idea of social identity and self-categorization. Social identity is simply the idea that in our everyday lives, we don't have just, we're not all only individuals, but there are more ways to perceive ourselves as members of different social groups, of national states, of uh, football teams, of um, in terms of colleagues with other people from the same profession. There are many different ways in which we conceptualize ourselves. And of course, these have, they're important in terms of um, emotions, evaluations, and other psychological factors, how we see ourselves in terms of our group memberships. And if you try to think about yourselves in your everyday lives, 
most often you feel like a group member of some different groups than a unique individual. And there is a theory that followed the social identity theory, which was called the self-categorization theory back in the late 80s. And then the key concept was how do individuals, why do they, how do they come to perceive themselves as members of social groups? Why and how can we come to see ourselves as group members with others, as members of a certain group? And the main idea here is that the sense of self is very fluid in different contexts, in different occasions, in a very dynamic manner. As the context changes, um, we might perceive ourselves as individuals and in other contexts, very dynamically as group members. And if there is collective behavior and collective coordination, and collective mobilization, it's because of some shared social identity, this sense of psychological connection to someone else in terms of shared group membership. And there are some criteria for what we call entitativity, perceiving some objects or subjects as being together, part of the same group. These are proximity, being close to one another might lead us to come closer. Being similar to one another, we might have some similarities that help us um, bond easier. Or common fate, common suffering, something, some common distressing factor that makes us perceive each other as part of a group. And the key concept here is that when there is common fate, when a disaster hits a community, you might have individual group members going on with their daily lives as individuals, not talking to one another, not knowing one another, not wanting to interact with one another, but perceiving, experiencing common fate, a flood disaster that affects everyone, for instance, makes this cognitive, let's say, shift, this psychological shift, where instead of me versus you, it's us versus this disaster in a more dynamic way. The context changes, our social relations might change. We might perceive each other as part of the same group. We've seen this with research on police and crowd behavior. When the police treats crowds indiscriminately, people tend to come together against the police in a very dynamic way. So when there is a certain social identity, when we come to perceive each other as part of the same group, as psychologically closer to one another, there, there is a set of different changes that take place. So we are more oriented towards group interests, who gets the support, our group needs to actually benefit, we need to help group members. I cooperate with group members, not just with people very close to me or just by myself. Um, whose well-being is prioritized? The collective well-being. Whose safety? The group safety. We have shared goals as a group and we trust group members more. And I will describe all this with empirical research in a while. But in general, when we turn to perceive each other as parts of the same group, we reorient towards the collective, not the individual. And this is the theoretical model that I will be discussing in a while. This outlined in a paper we published recently, where we talk about collective resilience. And by collective resilience, we mean this potential of crowds or groups to organize collectively, provide and expect support. That's what collective resilience is that we can actually, we have the capacity to come together and support each other as a group. And here is a more dynamic model of how this takes place. You have common fate as an antecedent that suddenly uh, a, co a community is hit by flooding, a group is hit by uh, a bombing or something like that, and people come to experience common fate. Or if you think about the Twin Towers, people wouldn't know each other in the buildings before the planes hit, once they hit, we see this emergence of collectivity, people talking to each other, exchanging information, support, helping each other uh, to safety. So common faith leads to certain social identity, to this sense of collective, um, perceiving each other as a member of a group. And this comes with different consequences. At the cognitive level, we orient towards the collective interests. At the relational level, of course, our social relations change. We help each other, there is more civility. We trust each other more, we expect each other more. And if you think about trust as a core aspect of social capital, for instance, certain identity might be an aspect of how this is facilitated. Yes, we have trust, but why? Maybe because we see each other as psychologically closer to one another. And the outcomes, of course, are collective efficacy, empowerment, I will discuss about this in a while. Self-regulation of behavior, it's something we see. Coordinated action, safety and well-being. So you see this process through its common fate, leads to identity, which leads to all these positive outcomes. 
So I will now show you very briefly some findings from previous studies before I discuss our findings from community response to flooding, mine and Logan's work. One of the first papers to be published in that um, topic by John Drury and colleagues was survival reactions to the 2005 London bombings. The questions were how did people behave, what support provided and why. They had primary data from interviews and written accounts with survivors from the bombings and secondary data from newspapers accounts and archival documents. And what did they find? There is a pattern whereby when the bombs exploded, went off in the tube and people were strangers just going to work, they actually came together spontaneously, gave support, accepted support. They saw others helping others. There, were, there was a very low level of selfish behaviors uh, people that didn't support was usually because they couldn't, they were not able to, not because they didn't want to. And there were many references to unity, uh, many references to warmness, solidity, empathy with one another, this emergence of empathy that was not there before. And there were no accounts of fragmentation or disunity. There was a sense of collective coordination, there was no panic, there was emergent togetherness and support, which was very, very interesting. And again, in absence of any pre-existing bonds and networks and ties. Another study that followed, again by Drury and colleagues, interviews of 21 survivors of different emergencies, from stadium crashes, stadium fires, bombing, sinking ships, music events that almost turned to disasters. What are the findings? One more one. And what were the key findings? There was shared social identity. Um, um, there was shared social identity, which increased uh, expression of solidarity. There were no individualistic behaviors. And that shared identity emerged from the shared experience um, of the emergency, right? It was not there before, it emerged during the changes in the social context. There was mutual support perceived sense of unity, um, it was very widespread. A very wide sense of inclusiveness and common fate in the interviews. Lots of social support provided and people reported high shared social identification and orderly behavior. So again, across all these different events, we have all these patterns, emergent solidarity, emergent social support because of common fate. And then this model was examined statistically in an earthquake in Chile with survivors um, of an earthquake in 2010. It was served with 1,240 participants that experienced the earthquake, so a massive sample. So this model was tested in a quantitative manner for the first time, and that's what we saw. Common fate led to shared social identity, and this led to people giving emotional support to others they perceived as closer to them, and to more expected support from others we are part of a group, I expect support from my group members, which led to collective efficacy, who can all act and support each other, and to provide coordinated support. We can all come together and support one another. So that was also very interesting, put the model to test, and it seems to be um, working, it can explain the variance in the data. So our questions now, based on all this literature before, were these. Mine and Logan's questions. Logan did his PhD in St. Andrews uh, at the same time as I did mine in Sussex. And these were our key questions. Do groups emerge in flooding? Because in flooding, you know, it's much more localized. You don't have this spontaneous event like a bombing in the tube where you have strangers, you have a community. So the question is, do groups emerge in flooding on top of pre-existing communities? Because you have communities, you have community groups, you have pre-existing bonds. So what happens in that case? And who engages in these types of groups? Also, what's the relationship between emerging communities and pre-existing communities? Because these two will interact. You have social capital, let's say, and you have emerging communities. What are the psychological processes? And does social identity play a role? If yes, why and how? Is social support provided? Again, and does identity play a role? And what happens to this identity? Does it endure? Does it decline? Does it become social capital? What happens? So these are two case studies that we will discuss in some experimental studies. In my case, I focused on York, which flooded in 2015 and 2016, Christmas of 2015. 
I had sets of interviews with residents, flooded, not flooded, indirectly affected, and surveys in the recovery period. And Logan, Logan Zhang from St. Andrews, visited the villas that flooded in Ireland in 2009 and interviewed participants, of course, and did a set of experimental studies. So I will describe all these findings together and discuss the bigger picture. So what happens at the early stages of flooding? So from my interview studies, I went to York um, a month and a half after the floods, got my backpack when it flooded, went up there, tried to find people to talk to and see what happened. I interviewed 17 residents and the patterns again are very clear to what I just described. People were saying that pre-disaster boundaries collapsed. Um, if people didn't talk to each other, class, race, religion, gender didn't play a role anymore. There was this emergent sense of community. People were saying that we were not talking to each other. We were very alone individuals, but then we came together. And of course they gave support despite any, the absence of pre-existing connections. And then we discussed this. But th these are the types of extracts that were appearing. That's a flood resident first. I would imagine the mentality of everybody coming together in the time of crisis. I felt I wasn't alone, it was really nice. <clears throat> and another person was saying, there's been a real sensitivity if somebody looks sad and there's been a hand on the shoulder. It's sort of non-verbal type of thing. Um, tears came to my eyes and the lady came to me and she was like, right, okay, can I, uh, where can I point you in a direction? Here is a number for blah, blah, blah. And she was there, I have no idea. I know her name now, but I had no idea who she was, why she was offering support. And the pattern is that this emergent sense of togetherness, this coming together of people to support one another, people make references to this collapse of pre-existing bonds, uh, pre-existing boundaries, and the emergence of something new, that people were not talking to one another, there was no community, and we became a community because of the disaster. And we see many different reasons why this happened. Because of common fate, because of a potential common fate, people are saying, this could have been me. I didn't know who these people are, but it could have been me. I went and helped them clean their houses. Because of shared goals, in many times, common fate was experienced because of the council, for instance, not doing what it was supposed to be doing. So people came together because they all experienced the same distress from the council and their response to disaster. Shared goals, actually, to it was a reason for unity or saying secondary stressors. People suffered from the same problems after the disaster, like looting in neighbor, neighborhoods where there was looting. They experienced the same distress. They felt like as part of a group. In terms of social support, people gave each other emotional support, practical support, and expected support. Um, they, ex they were expecting support from other people um, who they didn't know before, and they came together in a, coll in a collective manner to support each other. Logan found similar patterns in the Irish village he visited in 2018, nine years after the disaster. Interviews with 18 residents, flooded and not flooded. Um, emergence of shared social identity between affected and unaffected residents. So the community came together actually. There was widespread provision of social support. There were very, very low numbers of selfish behaviors which disappeared after the floods, straight after. But interestingly, he said that in his case, there was an emergency community, but there was also a very strong pre-existing community and very strong pre-existing social cohesion. So there was very strong social capital in his case, on top of what also happened for the emergent community. So he did an experimental study, a very, very interesting experimental study. How, the question was this, how does the severity of the flood, whether it's severe or mild, and pre-existing unity, unity or no unity, affect emergent social identity and helping behaviors? And that's what he found. The more severe flooding was perceived to be, the higher the shared social identification between people, and the higher the level of social behaviors. So the more severe, the more you identify with your group, and the more support you gave, for instance. But the more interesting thing here is that this was moderated by pre-existing identity in that this effect was stronger for those with low emergent identity. So if there was very strong pre-existing unity in the community, emergent identity didn't play such a big role. So we see how these two interact. 
you have a strong pre-existing community. There is some emergence, of course. It, it, there will always be some change in social relations, but the pre-existing social bonds operate. If you don't have that, the emergent community comes together and takes its place in the social context and gives support. So very, very interesting connection between the two in a very dynamic way. And what happens after the flooding? So once the disaster is gone, once the floodwaters have receded, the disaster is still there, what happens in this social identity, in these social processes? After the disaster, what happens usually is that this common fate disappears. There is no disaster anymore, so people tend to stop perceiving each other as a member of the same group. And we've seen this in many, many cases, and we even saw this in the beginning of COVID. We have some data now that show a decline in social support, essentially, which might be because of these declines of communities. Um, so the communities decline after the first few weeks, old problems appear again, um, the recovery begins, and social support might not be available from this emerging community at the time when it's most needed. When the recovery begins, it's when people usually need lots of support, but these emerging communities might not be there anymore. Also, this is when social secondary stressors start operating. For instance, people start to claim um, insurance money, and it's one of the most distre distressing processes because it might last for years. So in that case, the endurance of these existing communities or of social capital that is created by these communities is very important because these communities give support in the recovery period when it's most needed. So let's see what Logan found first from some experimental studies. The first question is, when is social identity stronger, in the beginning of the disaster or later? What are the effects of observing unity in the community in terms of processal behaviors and what does social identity do? And his findings, very briefly, are that as we expect and as we find, social identity is stronger in more recent disasters, there's one that are more distant, which makes sense, and when, you, when we observe unity, when we observe a cohesive community, it creates a certain social identity. We feel as part of something, and this affects a set of pro-social behaviors, time donation, money donation, how many items you give, or the value of the items you give. So observing unity, observing people together is beneficial because it creates certain social identity. So if you think about social capital, observing a cohesive community, even if you're not a part of it, might make you feel a part of it and actually engage if you identify with this community. So we can see a bit of how engagement, involvement happens in a more dynamic way. How social capital, for instance, might be facilitated and how social identity might be an underlying mechanism of how these groups are created in the first place. In my interviews that I carried out 15 months after the floods with 19 residents, 16 flooded and three disrupted, we saw a pattern both of decline and of endurance. Um, so in some cases it declined and we can expect some reasons. There was no common fate anymore. There was no reason for unity, at least a very obvious one. And there was a return to individuality. Um, in other cases, there were reports that I got from people in the traveling community in New York where they came together, they were saying that it was the first time after all this racism and discrimination that we became a community, settled residents and the traveling community came together, we gave support, we were talking to each other, then the authorities came, they gave more support to the settled community, and actually these boundaries, this division, this discrimination took over again, there was no community anymore, it was us versus them. So inequality in the post-disaster treatment actually destroyed the social ties that had been created, which was a big problem, of course. In other case, it was identity shifts. People stopped perceiving themselves as part of, uh, as flat victims. So this made them not identify anymore. And in some times it was beneficial. If it's a toxic identity and it's harmful, it's best to disassociate from it. But in that case, it caused a decline of this collectiveness. But in other cases, this sense of community endured, which is very interesting if we want to think about why all this emergent community transforms into enduring social ties, which we might say social capital. People came together and said, we experienced this in the past and this made us become friends and we're still friends, you know, 15 months after. 
So the past experience of common fate was one reason why this emergent ties endured. Another reason was the persistence of secondary stressors. Structural problems persisting in the post-disaster context made people remain together. In other cases, commemorations in a very strategic way made people um, facilitate and empower these bonds that had been created during the flooding. People were saying, we came together to support one another, we want to have a party to remind ourselves what a strong community we are, what we became during the disaster. Or through the ongoing provision of social support. People getting support 10, 15 months later said that it made them feel as part of a community. So we see different processes through which these social ties remained in the long term of the disaster, some of which happened were emergent bonds, they didn't pre-exist the disaster. So we can get an idea of uh, social capital creation. And Logan found the same, that emergent identity was short-lived and disappeared after the floodwaters. But again, in his case, there was a very strong pre-existing community anyway. So we can see the dynamic interaction between the two. And finally, this is a survey I did um, in York in the recovery period to see whether social identity processes still operate. So I sampled almost 3,000 houses. Um, in total, we had 500 participants. Um, the surveys took place 8, 15, and 21 months after the disaster. And we see the same model that it applies also in the recovery period. So shared identity also operates after the disaster, and it's very important for, this, for these reasons. We saw that common fate led to shared identity many months after, past common fate, and then shared social identity led to expecting, expecting support from group members and to shared goals. We can all organize and support one another in the community. We can come together for the same reasons. And this led to collective efficacy and to increased individual well-being. So you can see the benefits of social identity also in the recovery period of these social bonds that may be solidified, let's say, all these months after the disaster from eight to 21 months later. So these are the main limitations I addressed in the beginning, that social capital doesn't take into account psychological communities in a more dynamic way, how emerging communities become social capital, become ongoing social bonds, that it can't account for the spontaneous creativity among strangers, we need this more dynamic approach, it doesn't take into account the mechanisms that underlie all these operations, and we need the more systems approach that, inter that considers interactions between all these factors. So in general, a final overview, this is what we have found, a very brief summary, that in extreme events, and we have now evidence from all types of disasters and in both the direct impact and in the recovery period, that social identity processes operate in both sudden impact incidents like um, earthquakes or bombings that can be predicted, and in rising tide disasters like flooding. Social, capital, social identity processes operate. There is this dynamic element of identities changing, and these changes in the self-concept and the social relations being very beneficial. We know that psychological communities among strangers can emerge both within a disaster when there was no pre-existing community and also in places where there was a geographical community and in some cases a pre-existing community. So these two are not mutually exclusive. You might have a pre-existing community, you might have an emergent psychological community over it for new reasons, for new purposes, with new directions. Social identity processes, it's a very helpful concept to make sense of how groups emerge, how they're created in absence of any pre-existing groups, and how social support is mobilized, that identity might be the basis for social support in some cases. Um, identity might be the, a psychological mechanism for why social capital operates. It's very useful, we know it works, there are thousands of papers on social capital in disasters, on why social identity, group membership, this psychological element, this um, change in social relations might be one of the reasons why we see that social capital works and how it develops and how it endures.
Um, now, groups, as I said, can transform into social capital, which is very, very interesting. Emergent identities interact very dynamically with pre-existing unity. And group emergence, endurance, and decline depend on both psychological factors and structural factors. Sometimes people intentionally and strategically try to facilitate these connections and support them again and reinforce them. And sometimes it might be psychologically because of common fate, for instance. And the final important thing is that it's, it's good news that um, official guidance has now started considering um, emerging communities. There is some discussion about them, but it's not enough. And what we have seen, and we have also suggested in some of our papers, is that guidance must become much more explicit, not on this more abstract concept of we need to make communities resilient. It's a bit of a buzzword, resilience nowadays. We need to be resilient. The communities have to be resilient. The question is how? What are the exact mechanisms through which communities become resilient? Social capital might be one of them, and it is. We need strong social bonds and social ties. We need that within communities, between communities, between organizations, communities, but we need more than that. And we need to be more precise about how this happens. What are the exact processes in terms of social support, how it's provided, in terms of community resources. We know that communities will come together in disasters. Can we have spaces and tasks that are easy to carry out, of course, because these people need to want to support each other. And sometimes there is this intergroup division created between responders or authorities and communities because they're not given the space to actually support. You don't help create, facilitate trust between responders and communities. And trust between these is very important, both psychologically, you need to trust one another, see each other as having certain goals, setting a social identity, and there's a social capital. It's the same message. We need community resources. People need to trust authorities. A very quick example here, in York, 15 months after the disaster, the community want to have a street party to celebrate the recovery, to celebrate the community. They ask for permission from the council to actually give them support, to allow for this to happen, a very one evening street party. They said no. And this is important because it creates a division between you and the council, the community and the council. It doesn't allow for trust to be facilitated. It doesn't show care, it doesn't show respect. Um, it's problematic in, for many different reasons. There must be emphasis on the use of spontaneous volunteers, how people come together, what tasks can they carry out, how can they bond to some extent with the responders. Um, leadership is very important of the authorities or community leadership because they can source social identity. People trust community members more. They will trust community leaders more. And of course, equal treatment. If you have inequalities, if you have um, unequal treatment of minority groups and majority groups, it creates community division. It doesn't allow for stronger social bonds. It ruins the response and the recovery. So problematic for all sorts of things. So I think that the, overall, the social identity approach is very interesting. It gives us an idea of a very dynamic idea of how groups come together, how they endure, how they decline, how social bonds in the long term are created, how they're disrupted. So I think in general that social capital is very interesting. It's, it's very useful, practically useful, but we need some more insights on the dynamics of it and how it interacts with more psychosocial process of behavior and social relations and why this change. And I think that social identity is a step forward to try and address um, why this happens. So I'm done. I will close this, stop sharing. Excellent. Thanks very much, Evangelos, for a really fascinating uh, presentation. Certainly really enjoyed that. And I can see how social identity is so um, critically important to understanding social capital and, and social capital processes. But I also find it really hard to see how most of the approaches to social capital could really take into account social identity in a meaningful way, you know, taking into mm -hmm. account the fact that most people tend to view social capital as, as social networks. Mm 
um, and all of the social processes, social psychological processes uh, associated with those networks are effectively assumed, you know, that if a network exists, then there must also be trust and there must also be, you know, belonging mm -hmm. and norms yeah. and, and so forth. And so I think, uh, you know, um, social psychology and probably psychology in general has an enormous amount to contribute towards social capital um, theory or conceptualizations. But as yet, we haven't seen a great deal of engagement, I think, from psychology on the concept of social capital. Um, so I'm partly interested in why you think that might be the case. Uh, and also, if you know anyone else who is doing some work in this space, um, who may be able to push that forward. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, it's, it's interesting. And I think one of the main reasons is because of this disciplinary, um, there, there are two different disciplines, right? And if social capital is mostly used in more sociological type of studies or by non-psychologists, let's say, right? Um, it's hard to actually um, use it more um, to, to, to bridge this division. And that's what we're trying to do at least. I am aware of one area where it has been um, used by some psychologists in Queensland, Alex Haslam and um, the, the whole group of psychologists in Queensland, in their book on the social cure, in terms of how social identity is beneficial for health and well-being, they are addressing social capital again as a reason for health and well-being. You know, you have cohesive communities, you have higher well-being, essentially. Um, and one of the critiques is exactly this, that Social capital is very interesting, but it doesn't allow us to find why the things happen. And I guess at the policy level, a starting point is to say, as you said, it's all assumed that we have these, we know the groups are there, the communities are there. Why should we bother about the dynamics that underlie them, right? If we have them, we know they're useful. This needs to be a policy um, goal, a policy aim. But then I think it's important to open up discussion to this more. Because then the question, it, it becomes this problem we identified in governmental guidance documents. They all say, we need to have resilient communities. We need to have cohesive communities. How? You need to have practical steps for responders to actually make these communities resilient. Just by saying to someone, make this community more resilient, it's not enough to do it. You know, you need to give actual steps on how this works. And partly that's what we try to do in our latest papers, that we give a statement of not a theoretical statement. I, we don't expect responders to know social psychology, right? But it's practical steps, practical um, things that can be done to actually do it. Communicate more, communicate with trusted sources, um, because this will create in the long term more trust. It will create some um, bonding between you trust more people that give you the advice. If you don't have, a, and there is research on that. If you don't have certain social identity, if you don't perceive, um, the provider of information as close to you psychologically, a trusted, trusted source, you won't take what they say into account. It's a matter of leadership. Um, it's all sorts of practical steps, but to identify these, we need to have a knowledge of the processes and psychological means, you know, from these more technical papers. But I think there is, a, there is good progress in terms of people starting to make sense that groups are useful, but why? And of course, academics are doing the job and we don't expect people to be psychologists, but I think it's a good step forward in terms of the processes of how do you make these organizations trustworthy? How do you make communities resilient? How do you give them space? Do you give them resources? Um, you know, even space for a street party. It's important to show trust between the council and the residents, to show the community coming together and remembering that they have a community. Uh, so it's interesting for both intra-group reasons within the group and between groups. And just by saying no, you destroy all this potential. So I think policy needs to have this in mind that we need exact steps of how to achieve all these things, the processes, not just we need strong bonds. We know this work, that's a fact, but how? How do you facilitate this? And it needs to become less descriptive, let's say. I think that's my whole take on it. Yeah, we have exact steps and not general statements. And these steps will be the processes, basically. People will come together because of this reason. What can you support them? They need space because spaces are important, again, structural elements for identity building. They need tasks. And the tasks, again, generate trust between you and the responders. 
that generates more bonds within the community. So, you know, it's like a puzzle. You put the piece together and it keeps building itself. And that's what we need to be more aware of. And it seems at least in part, it's also about identifying opportunities and not also identifying risks. Because I think exactly. what we see with a lot of these processes is by doing things just very subtly or very slightly differently, there can be large opportunities to, to have mm -hmm. great gains. And by the same token, we can perhaps do something that we think is innocuous and is going to, is, is benign, but it actually does a significant amount of damage or, or has a negative mm -hmm. impact on those emergent communities or on the nature of trust or identity or belonging, mm -hmm. you know, within that particular context. So I think, uh, social capital overall, though, and I'll open it up for questions from other people in, in just a minute as well, but just following this line of thought a little bit more, it, it seems like because social capital is such an incredibly broad term, you know, covering across all of the possible benefits of sociability or, or social mm -hmm. action, that it seems very difficult to then really get into those processes and understand everything that's going on underneath this umbrella of virtually everything. And so quite often the way that social capital is used almost uh, universalizes or dumbs down or, uh, you know, fails to communicate effectively what's really going on because the terms are simply too broad. Mm -hmm. And in the work that you've done, have you found that you continue to use the term social capital or do you actually replace the broad term with the specifics like social identity and trust and those sorts of things that actually communicate more effectively? Yeah, so we focus more on the exact terminology. It's social trust, it's sense of community, it's sense of space, it's um, expecting support, it's collective efficacy. Um, we make it much more specific because social identity, it's just this shifting social relations and that's it we know that and then this generates trust it generates it becomes the basis for other changes to happen later on so we try to be much more specific because even if you see that if you remember the slide i showed earlier about norris and colic is the four different dimensions of community resilience as part of social capital they also include psychological verbs like sense of community and this is more a psychological more dynamic concept than bonds, pre-existing bonds. So in my work, when I talk about social capital, I make it specific that I talk about pre-existing bonds and groups and networks within and between communities. And I, I stay at this to make, to emphasize more the dynamic nature of the psychosocial approach we're um, working on anyway. So and yeah, certainly it becomes much more specific, yeah. Social capital is a very broad term, but it also one that is embedded with uh, with value, you know, it communicates mm -hmm. value. It says this is important, and that and all of the other concepts, you know, trust and resilience and belonging and you know identity, all of those things, they're not embedded with, you know, an explicit statement of value and importance. And I think that's perhaps the reason to continue to use social capital as the umbrella, um, but not dumb things down and hopefully get to the specifics like you're talking about, rather than using mm -hmm. such a term that is so broad. But I, th I think there's also space for separating the two, right? Because, because if you use one of them, I mean, the point is that if everything is social capital, then what is social capital, right? Then if, right. if everything is this, then why is it useful? And I think there is some, there is some benefit in separating the two or not the two. It's not, I don't try to distinguish them necessarily, but you know, if you have emerging communities, there is a totally different set of processes happening um, compared to when you have general trust in the community or general sense of belonging. There is something very specific happening. And to put this together, I think you lose this variability, this different set of processes that take place. But in general, yeah, I think both are useful concepts, but for in different areas and they show you different things essentially. But I wonder whether they need to, you know, like uh, as you're talking about how different processes are at work, clearly the context is different, but I mm -hmm. wonder how many of, if what social capital is lacking is effectively a, you know, a robust theory of human experience that is capable of, mm -hmm. of actually making explanations. And mm -hmm. so if we were to build that theory into social capital, then I think we could still explain it in emergent communities, certain things are happening for sure that are, that are mm -hmm. a result of that context, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's altogether different than what's happening um, all the rest of the time. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I think, you know, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is that I'd love to see a bit more work from social psychology on, on social capital to, to help to improve the way in which social capital is actually understood. Mm -hmm. No, I fully agree. I mean, at the end of the day, we're concerned about human behavior and human cognition, right? And social factors like trust. So I don't see it necessarily as a strict division. I just try to be more precise in what I refer to because it helps us understand more the processes. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, yeah. definitely. So we do have a question in the chat um, from uh, Georgios. Uh, let's just see if I can read this for you. Seems that there are some similarities between emergent groups and established groups in terms of psychosocial processes. One could say that what occurs in emergent groups, e.g. the boundaries dissolve solidarity, self-organization, is the peak time of group collective action in general. Any thoughts on how we could promote those processes when involved in established groups, e.g. social movement groups? That's, that's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think one of the comments that we also make in our papers, at least, not in terms of collective action, but sometimes you have, for instance, groups that emerge in disasters and then they are sometimes they solidify, so they endure, they keep going. And I think the key point here is that what these groups need many times is um, support. They need structural support, not just ecological support, but resources and spaces to coordinate. And um, so, for instance, with COVID, we saw groups emerging. The UK had 4, 000, more than 4,000 mutual aid groups emerging when, the, when COVID hit, right? So these were all emergent mutual aid groups potentially by this sense of common fate, we need to support each other. And essentially they had the space to actually work from, they had the space to coordinate. And the decline usually happens when there is no event salient, but I think it will depend on the group. In social movement groups, I think there will be very different um, processes taking place compared to emerging groups in disasters. So I don't think I have a direct answer right now, but I'm, I'm just trying to think. What so for instance, with voluntary groups in COVID, which were more enduring, more solidified groups, so people that were volunteering, what, make, what makes a difference usually is the structure of the groups, whether they're horizontal or vertical, um, how much freedom people have, how much support they have from leadership, so there are many different factors that help all these groups um, and you're even if they are established. So you have established volunteering groups, but why do we keep, keep volunteering? And again, identity processes play a very big role um, and the structure of the groups play a very big role as well. But to be more specific, we need to have more specific examples in that case, I think. Yeah, I think that it probably does relate to that typical duality of, of, of society that there's structure and agency or, you know, a system or life world where it's yeah. not just enough to have intersubjectivity going on and those individual personal relationships, but you kind of need the structure to be established you know, for there to be mm -hmm. certain roles and rules and, you know, sort of yeah. it solidifies those, those shared understandings and there's something that perhaps is a little bit more capable of, of, of um, enduring for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So any other questions from the group, feel free to put your hand up or you could unmute yourself. It's a fairly small group. And you can put something in the chat as well if you would like to. Hey, Evangelos. Hey, Stacey. How are you? I'm good. It was Perfect, brilliant talk, really interesting. Um, oh, so I'm just, that's all right. So I'm just kind of um, going off what sort of Georgios's comments and your responses there. Do you think then that perhaps councils and policymakers, or or you know indeed in existing groups, should focus more on facilitating cohesion building activities within communities and within established um, groups to allow these social bonds to develop and endure? So I'm thinking, you know 
with my research in communities, we use a lot of social identity mapping to help build those, that sort of sense of cohesion with communities coming in together. You know, what, what do we offer each other? What's important to me? And how does that reflect within the group? So do you think that that's sort of a focus that maybe should be taken when looking at communities or looking at, at groups enduring? Absolutely, I think so. And I was thinking of your work as well when I was thinking of these points. Um, and I think you have more to say because you know more of this topic, um, you have knowledge of this, so you can tell us some things actually. But I, I think absolutely, there are ways to do it strategically in, in both direct and more indirect forms. You can have, of course, activities like bringing people together strategically, intentionally to actually try and facilitate something, but also a bit indirectly, as I said, by giving space, by having public spaces to allow coordination, to allow for um, activities to happen, to allow them to come together organically without you enforcing this to happen. But it's about resources. And I think it's interesting because many times people, people have the capacity and willingness to volunteer. And many times if the council or the authorities say no, people will do it anyway. And then they engage in much more risky tasks, more dangerous tasks anyway. And it might cause more problems in the long term. The last thing you need as a responder is to try and save people that are volunteering as well on top of the actual victims. So it's about yeah, having structures, having um, space. I think space, community resilience, it's about communities. It's not just psychologically thinking in our minds, it's about where we coexist. So having the space to organize and meet and give support and you know even just a place to gather donations because people will be there to sort out donations. I was doing that in New York when I visited uh, that's what I spoke with some people. They were already gathering donations. Give these public spaces because we have we know what will happen if a disaster hits. People will donate. They will form groups. They will. So how can you use this? How do you communicate with these groups, for instance, both for the practical aspects, but also for the psychological aspects that are created? More trust, more communication, more you know, and this makes everything smoother later on. But what do yeah. you have in mind? Because I think you know quite a few things about that. So in terms well, of activities I, and... I agree kind of that you do, you need that, that opportunity in that space. I think that the problems or, or certainly the problems that I found are that where those initial reactions and those initial space is provided, where those community centers are provided, where forums are set up for neighbors, neighborhood members, community members to come and speak and speak with um, agencies, right? So you can have the local police coming down and being a part of the fire service coming down and being and, and everybody sort of coming together and talking, you know, best steps forward. Um, it's what happens, as you say, this quickly dies out. And I know that a lot of research I've done within some communities, certainly within climate change, but also with, with, within regeneration is the fact that communities still want those spaces to be available post change. Yeah. And that facilitators, policymakers, police officers, they're no longer given that opportunity. So then it just becomes the communities trying to meet in a local cafe because that, that space is not yeah. no longer sort of sourced. And then it quickly dies down and it becomes then these, these sort of little sections of community that then, you know, break off um, and the divides yeah. come back a little bit. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that that, for me, is one of the biggest problems. It's how we can make um, sustainable resilience rather than um, helping people to helping to facilitate resilience immediately following, which obviously is important, but it's how can that sustain past the event, if you know what I mean. I do, and I, I think it's, you know, more public space is less uh, privatisation, basically, of public space. It's, you know give people the space to use it in any way they like. So in the end, it's a very structural, um, it's a structure, major structural issue. If you privatize everything, people don't have any space to meet and people yeah. need to have these spaces, yeah. Yeah, um, I know Tom Posmes had done some research in, I want to say Amsterdam, but don't coin me, but also on a, on a similar thing. So developing a space where communities come together. And I think they came together through sort of theatre and um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But it, again, it still worked as the same. It facilitated that level of identity. So yeah. even those that were directly involved in that, the other community members could go and see some of the productions and it just sort mm -hmm. of helped develop this. But it was something that organically grew. So I think you're, you're right that space initially is something that can be built upon and to help yeah. with that resilience. 
this is something that I think perhaps the, the research done on social capital and the built environment might actually be able to contribute something to um, because uh, that yeah. same issue that you mentioned, Vangelos, about the privatization of those spaces um, is, a, is a big barrier to people being able to just simply meet and, and communicate and build those sorts of, of communities. And so where the built environment facilitates the sort of public interactions, then we see this is obviously not in disaster times, but we, we see, uh, you know, basically stronger social capital that tends to or can potentially, it's one of those sources that could bring about stronger social capital. And so using that same sort of understanding about how the built environment can shape the way people, not just people's ability to interact, but also the way in which they interact, you know, there's how people feel about the space when they're in it also seems to have quite a big impact as well. Uh, on this, I think I absolutely agree. And it's not just the built environment, it's also the more social environment in terms of, I mean, I have an interest, I recently found an interest in gentrification, right? And I haven't had any chance to work on it, but if anyone wants to cover it, I'd, I'd be happy to. But it's this idea that the sense of space also changes by who is in that space. And if you have communities that have been there, you know, for years and then an area is gentrified and reads people from one area or around there, and then it totally changes the whole landscape, the social landscape of the community. So it's both physical and the social, and I'd love to do more work on it, but yeah. I haven't had a chance to yet. I'd be happy yeah. to discuss there's, ideas though. There's, there's one other thing too about the built environment, which is just not necessarily spaces where people can interact, but also that they see other people. And I think the, there was, I don't think any research was done as far as I'm aware, but there was some uh, theorizing done when COVID occurred that communities that had, demon, where people demonstrated their social presence on the street. Um, so here in New Zealand, for example, people were putting little teddy bears in windows as a, as a sort of a symbol of, of social presence for other people. And so the sense of community in that kind of environment where people can basically see, even if it's not people physically, but they can see social presence compared to other urban areas where everyone's inside, all the doors are closed, all the windows are, are closed, you know, like there's no sort of visible, visible community in those sorts of areas and the kinds of psychological or social implications that may have come from that, I think would be quite interesting to, to do a bit of research on. Mm -hmm. I agree. And the other fascinating um, thing I've seen about the perception of noise, right? And there are some fascinating studies from some massive festivals uh, in India and from national commemorations in the UK, whereby people that identify more with the social categories perceive extreme noises as less annoying. So social relations even affect, you know, how you perceive your physical environment out there. And there are some fantastic studies on that. So there are all sorts of things about, you know, why social connectedness, and that's in a very broad term, identity, social capital, whatever way you want to put it, is beneficial, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but I think one mistake that psychologists do is that they tend to focus too much on individual cognitive level outcomes and they don't consider enough structural issues that are out there, you know. It's too much on the brain and not what's happening out there, forgetting that there is a social world out there. Right. Not such a problem yeah. for you social psychologists, though. <laughs> a good gap to fill in. Well, any other questions from anyone else in the group? Tristan, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, I've been in and out with technology issues, my apologies. Um, just wondering, uh, you mentioned, or did I mishear that you, there are Australian researchers in this area, in this space that are doing research um, in the same spaces as you are, Evangelos? Did you mention Australian or was I hearing things? Oh, no, no, you're right. So there is this group in Australia um, uh, led by Alex Haslam and Catherine Haslam. Um, I can write the names here. Thank you. Yeah. If you check Alex Haslam, you will see all their group will be there. Um, they're in Queen University of Queensland School of Psychology, and they are some of the leading groups in social identity work in all sorts of different um, contexts health, clinical settings, um, or social settings, organizational settings, leadership, 
So if you want to check their work out, it's yeah, it's fascinating work. Okay, and that was sorry, I'm not getting the um the chat. Is was it Haslam H A S L E M? Oh yeah, yeah, H A S L A M. Alex Haslam. Haslam, sorry, I'm, I'm having technology issues tonight. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, yeah, because we've actually got a resilience um, portfolio now in our government. Um, here, so I'll be interested in what their opinions are about how that's actually running, just on a general thing, but in terms of how much they're looking at social capital. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of bushfires. Um, it's mm -hmm. part of the uh, the nation and the and the um, climate that we actually have here. It's a natural phenomenon, and so uh, within Sydney and the Sydney area. So um, yeah, I'll be interested to see what they're doing. Can I ask a second question, Tristan? Yeah, sure thing. <laughs> I'm pushing my luck here. <laughs> um, I was just also wondering, because uh, when you actually sort of said that there's this decline of shared social identity in that post-disaster period, was there any mention of the fact that, um, like, in, in disaster contexts, et cetera, generally, uh, organisations like the Red Cross will come in and um, I'm a Rotarian and they actually have the shelter box phenomenon, which they actually ship or used to ship the uh, shelter boxes across. Um, was there any mention in your York research about any impact of, you know, very large assistance groups coming in that actually diluted uh, the group's social cohesion and or that wasn't part of it. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. So in York, it wasn't. It was quite a big flood, but not that big. And the only external groups that came were volunteers from other towns, nearby towns. Oh, Sheffield okay. from other nearby towns, and they went there and gave um, food and everything. Um, you know, without, again, without any pre existing medical, they just went there and supported. But there was no reference to larger groups coming in. Yeah. But I think that there is there is usually oh, sorry there is usually I've I've seen some papers where where they discuss about how sometimes organizations go and take over the whole response and sometimes they mm. push aside the response of the volunteers and this might create issues so it's about these two coexisting somehow or having uh, volunteering groups you know they're hard to coordinate it's in, they're informal you don't have a registry. It's hard to use them, but I think there could be some very specific easy to carry out tasks that would not stop community from participating and show their you know, appreciation and to provide their support through some very easy tasks to carry out that wouldn't put them in danger, of course, and would not disrupt the work of the services as well. Yeah, but of course, would... this, this will vary by the type of disaster, of course, anyway. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering because, you know, it's... Um... Uh, there's sort of this large mobilization of these very large organizations in major disasters, et cetera. And maybe that just people sort of go, well, okay, well, uh, these other people are going to fix the problem, whether or not that's been identified as that sort of getting in, you know, in the way of that cohesion. It's interesting to think about mm -hmm. in terms of that that's actually a major driver of the Rotary organization is to actually um, provide disaster re relief around the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're not doing anybody any favors, but it's hard. It's a hard question, isn't it? Yeah. Just thought I'd ask because it's interesting. Thank you. I think there is space for both, to be honest. And the other thing yeah. that we actually we make very clear in our work, because this work, you know, at the time when there is so much austerity policies and uh, privatization policies and everything. And governments are always trying to do budget cuts and things. Um, the, the point that we make very, very explicit is that just because people come to give support to one another and they have the capacity to be resilient is not an excuse for more governmental cuts, for instance, in the support that is provided. Actually, with mm. this, this natural, let's say, capacity has to be facilitated, has to be supported. If you want groups to endure, you need to invest in them. You need to expect that they will happen and invest in some resources, some spaces where they will have the space to do so. It's not an excuse to say, oh, they will deal with this anyway. Let's just defund it even more. You know, more public spaces, more public resources means more social ties, basically. So it's, yeah. Thank you.
That's unfortunate that social capital has been used in that way, you know, to justify budget cuts and to basically, you know, blame the victims for not organising enough or knowing the right mm -hmm. people or being exactly. connected enough. Um, so, exactly. yeah, certainly something we want to avoid. As Marion was talking, I was also thinking about the, the, the messaging of leadership as well seems to be one of those critical things that can shape the direction of a community response and, and that, that, that formation of, of shared identity and sense of community. Yep, we published a paper actually a few months ago on COVID and we compared um, New Zealand's Prime Minister with Boris Johnson and we analyzed their, their speeches at the nation. And you can see a stark difference between Johnson and Ardern because Johnson is always individualistic be careful, wash your hands, don't breathe, don't cough, don't do these things. And some mentions to wartime spirit and things, typical, let's say, UK bleed spirit rhetoric. If you see Jacinda Ardern's um, speeches, they were these fantastic calls to the nation invoking the history that we always took care of each other, we need to mobilize again, to emphasize this national identity, right? But with norms that are not about war or about anything, but about mutual aid and taking care of one another and that that's what we have already done that's what we will keep doing so i call all of you and also positioning herself as a member of the audience i am also a mother i know how you'll feel i have the same concerns we work for you so again connection to government and the audience the government as part of the audience um creating essentially an audience that's characterized by mutual aid and mutual support. And it was very different to the UK. Of course, that's not all that went wrong for the UK to have all these hundreds of thousand deaths, but one part of it is leadership, of course. And New Zealand, yeah. you saw this identity processes in, in it. And certainly, yeah, I mean, having lived through that um, in New Zealand, um, you yeah. know, I've got a firsthand experience of what it felt like to be part of the, what, Jacinda Ardern talked about as the team of five million. Um, yeah. So they really, she did, she was able to create a sense of, of common fate and a sense of yeah. community. So you can see how mm -hmm. it fits very nicely into your model, the way in yeah. which the, the common fate and the identity that was created as a result of that then resulted in all of the sort of flow on effects that meant that mm -hmm. the, uh, New Zealand was able to respond very effectively to the community. And you see it consistently in, in her messaging. And for me, the, the strongest thing, obviously the nature of the messaging was important, but we quite literally had 1 p.m. press briefings every single day, seven days a week. Yeah. And almost every single one of them was Jacinda Ardern and the Minister for Health. And so this became this, this shared experience that everybody in the community or a very, very large proportion of the community was experiencing the same thing every single day, getting the same mm -hmm. messaging powerfully every single day. You know, you'd look forward to it. I think it was the combination of both of those things, not just the messaging, but the consistency of the messaging and how many people then watched it as a result of that. Everyone knew, you know, 1 p.m. every single day. It was very easy to remember. And who is giving the message? In Greece, for instance, we had the same thing, but there was so much corruption and distrust of the government that people didn't bother about the message because it's who is giving it. It's do you see this person as caring for you, as working for you? Do you have this psychosocial, let's say, connection or something or not? If you don't, it's, it's a lost game, I think. And in Greece, we saw that quite yeah. clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So any other questions from anybody else? I feel like I've been hogging all of the question time, but... Um... <laughs> you have not, Tristan. <laughs> well, I very much like this line of, in, of, of um, questioning, this, this sort of line of investigation, um, uh, you know, applying social psychology kinds of ideas to social capital. So I, I could probably um, continue this for quite some time, but I'm not going to. Anybody else want a question? If not, I think we're pretty close to out of time anyway. So we could wrap up if, if no one else, last chance. No, all right, well, let's wrap up. Let's everyone thank Evangelos for his presentation.
Um, I know it takes quite a lot of time and effort to put something together and we really appreciate you, you getting involved and, uh, and sharing your, your research with us. Thank you so, very much for the invitation and for, yeah, for being yeah. here, all of you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk more through email if you have any more questions or do you want to discuss anything, just send me an email. That's great. So for anyone who's interested, we've got a, another webinar on social capital coming up in, uh, well, must be about nine and a half hours or so from now, not very long. Uh, we've got Associate Professor Paul Haynes is going to be talking about uh, the eight criticisms of social capital. So another sort of reflective um, webinar about the, the conceptual nature of social capital and potentially how it can be improved. So if you're available for that, uh, you're welcome to, to take part. Again, it'll be on Zoom and um, live streamed on YouTube as well. All right, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Seeing you next time. Have a nice day, bye.